Dogs of Warcry is a new podcast from the Mortal Realms focusing on Warcry, a fast-paced cinematic skirmish game by Games Workshop. Join us for discussions on gameplay, rules, lore, painting, terrain building, campaigns, and events. In Episode 3, we explore all the wonders of embarking on a new quest or campaign. You've mustered. Now catch up to your destiny. Welcome to the Warband. My name is Eric, or Stone Monk Gamer, and answering the call with me this week is Josh. How you doing, man? Excellent, thank you. And Haven, back at it. How are you doing? I'm living the dream. <laughs> and the dream is Warcry and the Bloodwind Spoils? Is that is that it? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. House of Talons, uh, baby. House of Talons. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to get started uh, just kind of reminiscing on the things we've been working on, the stuff we're putting on the table, etc., um, who wants to get us started off with hobby progress tonight? Um, I'm still working on my loon shrine. I got it all put together. I really st- stretched my conversion muscles, and I really am kind of pretty happy with the result. It's very kind of goblin in its construction, which is nice because I feel like I have a similar skills to goblins when it comes to constructing things. <laughs> uh, on theme and on brand. Um, I got the first base coat and washes down. I'm hoping not to do too much like layering because it is terrain. You should, I think you can get really far with just washes and just dry brushes and you don't want to just like take the focus away from the miniatures, um, or the other miniatures at least. So that's where I'm at. Heads down, staying strong. Uh, maybe I'll buy something later. Nice. <laughs> awesome. How about you, Josh? Um, right now, I've been mostly been focusing on brainstorming Cypher Lord color schemes since uh, since you've pitched the painting competition. So I've got three to four weeks to get my models painted up. And so got some ideas together and excited about trying to get that done. But I do need to finish sculpting fox ears on the rest of the warband and then get get working on that. So. Yeah, no, those fox ears are looking really cool. It was a, a, a really cool and unexpected kind of design inspiration and i think you're pulling off really well too can't wait to see them painted awesome um as for me um i've been working a little bit on the untamed beasts until you know trying to get them painted and for some reason i think it's because i'm trying to take them to a higher level than i expected um i got my cypher lords painted up really fast and these i'm taking a little bit of time probably because i'm you know having more fun with them and telling stories mm-hmm. um right. But uh, with the kind of rumors or the confirmation that there will be a Maw Tribes Ogre book coming out for Age of Sigmar, um, Ogres are the fir- my first Age of Sigmar army, Warhammer army, um, from years and years ago getting started. And uh, I had a, a conversion or a, a project that was midway that I've been working on mostly. So I've been working more on AOS. Um, that said, I think, you know, spent a lot of time this week uh, this past couple weeks or whatever, thinking more about the league, um, how many people are participating, how they're participating, et cetera. So that's been some of my hobby is mm-hmm. just wrapping my head around organizing people to play this game. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's, it's been cool. Um, and with that, uh, we got a little bit of news, uh, this past, uh, week or a couple of weeks. Uh, Josh, what was up with that? Yeah, just um, not this past Friday, but the Friday before, just before Monsters and Mercenaries came out, uh, GW did put out an errata and designer's commentary for Warcry, which has clarified a couple rules. And, um, you know, one one particular thing is they encourage rounding up to the, the most, you know, the next inch, for say, for measurements and terrain height. And they changed the onslaught to anything within three inches or less only. So those are probably the two biggest things. Changed some scenarios, clarified some things, but overall a helpful document that people should definitely make sure they they grab off the website. Yeah, yeah. The I think the favorite is clarifying the the cover rules, which I think is a bit more clear, yeah. uh, or a lot more clear. But there's there's still people that'll that are I've seen a few like questions of like, do, am I understanding this right? Uh, so I don't I don't know. It may be one of those things uh, that we are always gonna be chasing our uh, the dream <laughs> on on explaining that rule perfectly, um, but. A lot of good things in there. It's a pretty small document, like a page and a half. So that's yep. not so bad. Mm-hmm. 
Um, all right. Next thing that we want to do, um, and, and hopefully this may become a staple of the show, but I may jinx it just by saying it, uh, is to talk about the campaigns that we're involved in uh, and get a little bit of the flavor of kind of playing games, but without getting too tied up in the minutia or, you know, blow by blow. Um, uh, let's each take a minute and talk about kind of how our we've, we've finished up four weeks uh, we just started our fifth week um, of the campaign. Uh, let's check in and see how it's going. Paven, how is the Squig Squad doing? Uh, the Squig Squad is doing great. Um, I'm actually, I think I'm second in the in the campaign. Uh, feeling feeling good about that. Uh, I've had a bunch of really fun games. Been some really great guys in the league. Um, I played against Vince's Ghost, Ben's Iron Draws, and Chris's Deepkin recently, who are all like really great opponents. Um, the game I wanted to highlight, though, um, is a game I played actually versus Eric. Um, and I thought this was going to be one of those, you know, easy win Eric games. But, <laughs> but, I, but I was wrong. I I was wrong. It was, we were playing the ritual, which is a really like thematic uh, mission or victory condition where one war band is defending a point and trying to have a ritual go off that has kind of a random number of power accumulating in a spot and if like the the attacking warband interrupts it enough they win the ritual goes off then then uh the defending warband was and i was defending the ritual and i was coming up to a hot start feeling good i was taking out your fighters left and white and then like you know in the lap it just came down to the last turn and you just got all those guys on my on my ritual point you killed my boss like i had like one squig left and you i uh, came out with the w but it's a super fun high intensity game um and it was really like it was all randomly generated and it was a really cool map we played on. And I just uh, I thought that was like one of the best games I played. Nice, nice. No, I appreciate that. Uh, I both uh, um, outperformed your expectations and gave you a fun, challenging game at the same time. Uh, yeah, you know, it was I would agree. It was a lot of fun. And I do enjoy that kind of chewing on those those little tiny details is fun. Um, and it felt like we had a lot of choices to make along the way. So that was yeah. real cool. And uh, any other highlights for, do you have any um, characters that are kind of, that you're favoring or that, that are kind of making a name for themselves? Um, yes. Get Grit, my squig hopper, dies almost every game. <laughs> but never, he never, he never dies all the way. So he's doing good there. Um I actually think I'm going to upgrade him to a Boingrop Bounder since he's survived, although he's been taken out of action enough games that I think like, oh, he's like a veteran now. He's a veteran in Squig Hopper. So I'm going to like upgrade him with the armor and stuff, which is awesome. doesn't actually have a game rules. I'm just going to take him out of my roster and just replace him with a new Git Grit. Um, mm -hmm. Man of the match, man of the match, or the man of the matches is, is uh, definitely my Squig Bottle Finder, who's taken out many leaders, has two destiny points, very... Very good boy. Um. <laughs> <laughs> he is a surprisingly effective little guy. And overall, the campaign's been fun. Uh, all the people have been playing with and variety. Yeah. I don't think I've played... I think I've played a new warband every time. That's great. Josh, how's uh, how's the campaign going for the Envoys of Madness? Oh, going well. Thank you for asking. Um, you know, as, as I kind of alluded to last week... A week off with the Envoys of Madness. They were collecting alchemical ingredients and uh, used some iron jaws just to play against some other people because um, they've been doing particularly well. And uh, they were fortunate again this week in our game, Eric, and uh, managed to pull off a win, even though you took out uh, a lot of my models. But uh, but that was a uh, a very fun and narrative game. You mean uh, one of those good old guaranteed Eric win against Eric games? <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> It could have gone either word. way, but like, you chose <laughs> you chose to come after my shields instead yeah, of yeah. you know who knows what happened either way. I don't know, right? <laughs> and uh, how is it being on top? Does it feel like a lot of pressure going into the Varen Spire? Does it feel like uh, you know Archeon's looking at you particularly strongly? Uh, um, you you took it upon yourself to kind of take a, a week break to give. Um, you know, to just give people some different games, et cetera, which is really cool. Um, yeah. Anything else kind of jumping out at you for the campaign and, and, and being a particularly fun for you? 
Yeah, no, it's been it's been a lot of fun. And as uh, Paven said, I've been trying to play against uh, new players every every time. I played against a few people a couple times just to, to get games in, but uh, but it's been fun seeing the variety of warbands and learning the tactics that each each warband can do and how I can navigate scenarios and situations as they pop up. So it's, it's definitely been fun and challenging. So very cool, very cool. Uh, the Dogs of War Cry have. I won't say turn to corner because I think I've still got a, a higher loss than win ratio. Um, and some of that is kind of trying to figure out how they play. Um, you know, early on, you kind of, I, I've take I've took the kind of role of um, kind of aggressive, you know, pack of dogs kind of thing, but I feel like they are much more, they're better suited at kind of stalking the board and trying to get a better position and then kind of single out things and take them apart, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So I've been trying to be just a little bit more patient. Um, although um, one of the fun uh, ones, and, and we've talked about this a little bit uh, in the last episode, I have a, a planes runner that um, kind of aimed above their station. And uh, um, in a game that, that Josh and I played against, uh, Josh and myself and Paul, uh, where my planes runner killed his thrall master, and it was totally unexpected and and it shouldn't have happened, but uh, you know triple crits uh, will do that. Um, and uh, it was it was a fun kind of rivalry to start. And then uh, playing Pavend um, uh, was so this this planes runner got the name Smoke Blood for killing the thrall, um, and then she went on and killed um, uh, Pavend's um a squig rider uh, and it started a little bit of a trend and she started getting a little bit of, of an ego and so i uh, played a game against paul and uh she and one of my um rock tusk prowlers went off after his uh leader and and i was you know, three points away from from taking uh from smoke blood taking her down and so uh, she, I kept adding names, so she was Smoke Blood, and then she was Smoke Blood, Smoke Blood Squig Skewer, uh, and then uh, if I'd taken down the other uh, Paul's leader, um, it would have been uh, Wing Clipper uh, added onto that, and so I it kind of played out for me that she was got a little ahead of herself, a little too full of herself, and expecting what she could do, uh, and so in our game. Uh, you know, she wanted another piece of your thrall master, Josh. And I know that, and, and he wanted to put her in her place for sure. And so she was pretty aggressive getting out kind of fast and, uh, coming after your, uh, your leader and, uh, and Josh, what happened? Well, it was, it was delicious. I have to tell you, uh, you know, she, my leader wasn't the one to take her out of action, unfortunately, but she was taken out of action and, out of Eric's kindness, he rolled that she died. She, <laughs> so she, she, was... she permanently died. And so, being the uh, the nice narrative gamer he is, I said, "Can I narratively have your <laughs> your your poor planes rudder?" And so he did. And uh, so I wrote up a nice thematic story about what my thrall master did with his planes rudder. <laughs> Yeah, I and I can't read it. I, I mean, it's too hard for me. But no, it was uh, it was fun having kind of one of my. Uh, so there was a story out of the anthology that was about a plains runner who kind of uh, felt the call to be something greater. And so there was a little inspiration there, and it was fun getting some of those hail marys and seeing her accomplish some things that she shouldn't be able to, um, yeah. and uh, kind of have those epic moments. And uh, yeah, I think that's part of what this game is about. And so as part of the campaign, it's been really fun having a named planes runner that everyone's rooting for. Cause when she died, everybody, uh, or yeah, when she was slain, everybody was a mix of, of hooting and hollering and wondering what's happened to her, et cetera. And, <laughs> and so it was, it was cool to have a, a communal moment of well, not silence, the opposite of <laughs> grief. Yeah. The loss uh, of blood. <laughs> yep. Yep. So, uh, she was, uh, hated by many. So, uh, so anyway, but yeah, so the, and the campaign's been good. It's been, it, I agree, being able to play a bunch of different players, um, you know, we've come into our fifth week and we still had, um, you know, six games played, I believe five games played, um, and people sticking around until late to kind of shooting the breeze and talking about things. And, um, it's been fantastic kind of 
to have that in our community. So. Yep. Yep. And definitely getting together on other nights to play games and stuff too. It's been nice to be able to com- communicate with other players to arrange it, things. It does feel like there is more games happening outside of the our Thursday night league night. Um, you know, get you you've gotten together with quite a few people, uh, Josh, um, to play games and uh, in multiple locations. So um, yeah, no, that's very cool. And thank you for kind of being available to make those things happen for people. All right, before we close out this campaign update, I'd love to hear any ideas or thoughts on kind of how the campaign's running, um, having new players coming in, introducing them to new games, playing a lot, playing games, um, or just anything about running the campaign that you guys are thinking what's on your mind. Paven, is there anything that kind of is jumping to mind as, as, as we've been playing the games and, and kind of keeping an eye out for people's fun and engagement? Yeah, one thing I've been thinking about that, um, I don't know, I've been thinking about ways to maybe improve the experience is sometimes like, you know, different players have different number of games and I've been like super excited and trying to get lots of games in and I feel like I've gotten better at the game and I have like an artifact and, you know, some destiny. Um, but, I you know, on the, when the game that comes through, you know, there are people that are playing like maybe their second game or they're on their first convergence and sometimes that feels like I... I already have like many baked in advantages that doesn't feel as good. Um, specifically one that when I'm like playing their convergence, which is what they need to like advance in the game, I'm like coming in with a few more points and an artifact and like just the knowledge of having more games under my belt as well feels like I have like a, a few too many advantages. And I'm like, you know, in, in one you know, there is a there is an element where it's it's sometimes fun to like you know stop somebody from uh, completing their convergence because you're like you know playing a spoiler but I mean, but it's mostly like uh, you know you're the fun police for them and you're like oh, no no fun artifact for you because you know um, and so it's it's happened like a couple times in this league and um, I don't know I've been thinking about ways that like um, ways to like mitigate that because I feel like I have a strong warband and I don't want to uh, like, I don't know, I, it just, it feels a little bit over, like, not quite, like, I've just won too many advantages. Like, if I have a good warband and, like, I'm better at the game or, like, you know, things have been going well for me. Uh, but I don't also want to bring more more bodies to the game as well. So one thing I've been thinking about is just if the other person is on their first convergence, I won't bring my, like, you know, my tuned up squad. I'll have, like, a backup warband that I'm also excited about playing. We'll play a fun game, but then I just... I only have the advantage of like my own mind and I don't have all these, uh, these, these, bands, these other things as well. Like all these artifacts and these destiny levels. Um, you know, I'm trying to, and, you know, and it's something, especially cause we're trying to grow the hobby and grow the community here. And like, I don't want people to feel like they already are behind when they're coming and bringing their stuff to the store. Yeah. Um, no, I get that. I get that. I think that, I mean, obviously um, you're pretty fun to play against and that mitigates quite a bit of those, those advantages you have. Um, but I, I definitely appreciate, especially when, you know, somebody's only got a few games, it does feel like sometimes that you've got to treat it as a demo game or, um, you're, tr- and if you're going against them on their convergence, but you still don't want to lose your spot in the campaign or, or miss out on glory or an artifact yourself, what can you do to kind of put their fun in front of, you know, being competitive in the campaign setting. Yeah. Um, no, and that, and I think that sounds like a, uh, I mean, I'm glad that you're taking kind of a personal approach to it. Your roster can hold a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, can you have a, you know, a, a, a second string uh, war band uh, <laughs> from your roster? Yeah. yeah. That, that you're like, Hey, these guys, they, they need to, they need to cut their teeth. Uh, but they're not, they're not as good and they're not as tactful uh, or that sort of tactical or whatever. Um, or I think, yeah, like you said, like, do you play a different war band um, kind of an NPC so that you want to, you know, you want to give them a good game, but you're not as, as invested in the characters yeah. themselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. And, and Josh, you were playing, you know, a, a different war band during your, your hiatus for the envoys. Um, did you find that to be fun to kind of just switch to a warband that you weren't as engaged with for a little bit? Uh, certainly, yeah. No, I mean it's 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 a definitely a good way to learn how that warband operates and appreciate, you know, it also gives me insight on you know how the cipher lords play and what are the differences and how can I 
play against my own warband? Should I face them off, uh, face against them in the future? Or, you know, how do I use this warband's strengths to my best advantage? So it was a fun challenge. And I, you know, won one of the games, lost two of them, but it was still close in a couple of occasions. So. And you so, learned some humility along exactly. the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very cool. Any other kind of observations or uh, um, kind of things of note? that we're chewing on uh, before we get to kind of a, a big episode where we can talk about how we're going to add to it or homebrew it or Frankenstein it. <laughs> Any other things weighing on you? Yeah, not this time. I don't think. All right. I mean, yeah, we, I mean, I have a lot of ideas for things to expand or cool ideas to try, but that's like, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. All right. Then all of you guys, everybody listening, you'd be prepared for that episode where we both uh, tackle some of the, the things that we might feel aren't working as well um, or could use a, a boost or the things that we want to go crazy on and uh, dig dig our narrative heels into. Um, but not this episode. This episode, we're just going to get excited about all the cool toys that we get to play with, uh, with the core rules and monsters and mercenaries. Why don't we take a break? And when we come back, we'll get into our main topic. Thanks again for subscribing to The Mortal Realms. This is the last episode of Dogs of Warcry that will appear on this stream, but we're not stopping. No. You can continue to listen to us talk about the game, miniatures, homebrew rules, and campaigns on the Dogs of Warcry stream. Just look for us on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. In the next episode of the Mortal Realms story phase, we're covering Realm Slayer, the audio drama by David Geimer. See you then. All right, we're back. And uh, our victory condition for this episode is to discuss all the options available to players and event organizers, everybody who's interested in running or playing in uh, a campaign or an event. Now, we've got a lot of uh, shiny, fun narrative things um, to do with our war bands. We just want to kind of revel a little bit in the richness of, of options that we have out of the gate and kind of a little bit, we had that conversation last week about, you know, is um, monsters and mercenaries coming so quickly after feel like it can feel like it's a lot for some people who want to collect everything or kind of be on top of it. Um, but let's take a minute, talk about all the things that, that we get to play in uh, our war bands get to be challenged with. And let's start with, campaigns and starting a campaign specifically starting a roster uh, josh how do we get into the roster how is that used um and how does that help us kind of move along into these next things so the roster obviously is is the best way to capture information for everybody who's on your war band and in the sheet and whether they've got destiny levels or artifacts um and, and it also has the what we call campaign path where you, you know the number of battles you have to fight where your convergences are, when you get your artifacts, and when you get your command traits. And so it's a guide, essentially, for your warband and its growth, and, and narratively for capturing the names and everything else that you might want to include. Additionally, in the new Monsters and Mercenaries expansion, they have uh, expanded upon the roster. So now there's a se second roster where they kind of merge two different formats. And now you can also have a, a place to add any ally that you have with you or monsters, as well as track any challenge battles that you've completed and then additional exalted command traits. So it's kind of nice. It's expanding. And both of those are found in the back of the books for the rule book and the monsters, the mercenary book. Absolutely. And then we've also got um, on the Warhammer community website uh, in their facts and things or what is it called? Useful things. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. There's the, the Varen scribe app that lets you kind of do that digitally. Um, and I found that my desktop browser, you know, stores those cookies better than my mobile app. My mobile phone does. Nice. Um, uh, so that's helpful that I can kind of keep going back to it and updating, et cetera. Um, uh, Paven, what are some of the, when it comes to filling out a, a roster, um, when you initially filled out the roster or, or looked at the roster, was there anything that you felt like intimidated by or unsure about what it was for or whatever? And, and kind of what are some of the, the restrictions or guidelines for what you put into your roster to get started? Well, my first guideline is that everybody has to have a name. 
Um, Because you really want to know who your warband is, why they're fighting, what their background is, who their parents were, you know, (laughs) dreams, their hopes. Um, The goblins are fungus. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, goblins, all cowards, and, uh, you know, squigs, all great. Um, We'll we'll talk about that for a little bit, um, because right out of the gate in the core set, you have what you talked about backgrounds and uh, naming name generators and all of those kinds of things. Did you use those off the bat? Um, I definitely use the name generators. I find those, I usually, they come up with better names than I come up with for myself. Or sometimes I use the name generator and then tweak it a little bit, or I roll a couple times and see which one I really like. The name generators are all built into Varenscribe, the, um, the app we were talking about. So another oh, shout really? out to that. That's cool. Um, yeah, and you hit the not- refresh button on the right-hand side of the name, and it just pops one in there. And then you hit it again, and it'll pop something else until you get something you like. Yep. Nice. Um, yeah, so I did that for all my fighters, although I used – I kind of made up the names for all my squigs because squigs, I feel like, should have different names than goblins. Like, they're not, you know, they're you know, just <laughs> – right, they're right. pets. <laughs> um, I also um, – I really like name generators um, because I think it, like, helps you really, like – it gives more narrative to your games when you call, call somebody not, you know, my my third spear guy, but, you know, Grick. Right. And, and then when he dies, you go, no, Grick, you're dead. <laughs> um, Definitely. So I don't know what I was talking about, but it's <laughs> 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 a great. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I get fun from them. Um, I tend to give, like, everybody a first name, and then they can work up to their last name. Um, yeah. That's just for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I uh, I really enjoyed kind of the backgrounds um, and kind of giving you just a different sense of how, like in particular, your war band or your um, faction could come at at life from a different angle. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, whether that be to like their <clears throat> greatest thing for the untamed beast is to hunt the biggest beast, or if it's to see you know towers fall. You know, there's mm-hmm. just different ways to look at it and that adds a lot of flavor to me for kind of the characteristic of the war band and and uh getting into it eric what is the background for your uh, dogs of war so i have the background for mine and i rolled for this because i wasn't sure what i wanted and i you know i was kind of like wanted to let it become you know inform me but this was uh a shouldn't background is the dis- is a destroyer uh, and this warrior hates city dwellers and seeks to burn down all signs of civilization. Um, so leans a little bit more to the extreme side of, I think, the untamed beasts. Um, and then uh, he's also um, uh, iconoclast, um, or the warband origin is iconoclast. Uh, warriors delight in tearing down falsehoods of civilization. I imagine they like to pee in a lot of aqueducts. <laughs> if I can say that on the podcast. Um <laughs> But it's it's kind of yeah it's it's a little rage against the machine. Josh, do your uh, cipher lords have a background? <laughs> oh yeah, so um, I kind of came up with a background while they're they're wandering actually. They're they're intent to infiltrate the Varen's fire is their major goal, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I chose names that were of Japanese origin just so I could kind of look that up and use that as a guide because I like the kind of Asian theme that they kind of have going on. Mm-hmm. And uh, my leader's name is is Akiro. Oh, it's kind of like great madness is how it translates. So I kind of I kind of focus on that particular thing, and he has a, a dark obsession. So <laughs> it's his background, which is kind of fun. And how about you, Paven? What what kind of background did you pick? Okay, yeah. So my 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 group is they're bottle finders. So they're specialists at you know finding good glassware, and uh, that's the quest they're on. So I feel like it lines up really well. Um, and my boss, Skitrag. Uh, he is a, he's a foul temper and um, and his, his last name is Sour Tongue. So he you know he's a really st- he's a still really uh he real bad boss. <laughs> but he gets his job done. Nice, <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah, nice. <laughs> very cool, very cool. I've been uh, in terms of the name generator, I haven't used it because I did uh, named all of my planes runners like Runt. Like they don't have names; they just get called names. Um, mm. Except for Shadowblood, who stood out from the pack. Um, you mean Smokeblood? You already... Smokeblood, sorry. Shadowblood was the <laughs> first name I was going to call days. I know, whatever. <laughs> she, she's she's part of the churn. She's food for the food for the earth, um, for the great devourer. Uh, but uh, a couple of names, like my um, 
my first my big rock test prowler is uh sakubi doo um, nice. nice. and my uh uh other one is uh maduk mar uh so uh, a little play on the sunday morning cartoons i guess yep um so uh and at my first fan got named shatter spear because he threw his spear into a skeleton to pull it off a ledge and uh, pulled too hard and shattered it into a million pieces so it was pretty cool very nice anyway yeah so i mean all of those things just off the bat i think you're right give you kind of a first step into um getting into the narrative um what are some of the okay mechanically what are some of the restrictions if you know as a player kind of getting to it what do i get to have what am i restricted on uh those sorts of things josh uh, obviously, and, and they clarified this in the errata, that you have to have one leader in your warband, and only one leader can be in your warband and on the roster. Um, you can have up to 20 fighters on the roster, uh, but only 15 on the battlefield at one time. And uh, with the Monsters and Mercenaries expansion, you can have one monster and up to one ally per dominated territory in a narrative campaign, but, but not match play. You can just have one. Really, to start with, that's your only limitation, is just putting names on the board, um, your different fighter types, um, and it doesn't. You don't have to worry about um, uh, adding and removing them. It's free to do throughout any kind of campaign. Um, the cost is some of the choices: who you want to have on the list, and who you want to take off the list at any given time. And I do think rosters will become more important during kind of events where maybe you have a limited number of of things right on your uh, yep. roster for a given event, or like you've planned it out. Um, then we get into our fighters. We've already talked about kind of, uh, any, any of the fighters can be on your list from your faction, including the monsters and up to six allies. Uh, we've talked about namings and backgrounds. Paven, what's the important part about adding, uh, someone to the roster? Like when you're making choices on who to add or what fighters to add, um, what are we, what are we looking at? I'm sorry, Eric. I'm not sure what you're getting at. Um, I guess I'm trying to interpret can... variety and types. Yeah, I can right, jump in there right. then. So I think I think what Eric's kind of getting at is in terms of on your 20 list, you know, uh, 20 individuals on your roster, how do you decide which ones you might take into a particular game? And and what I kind of look at is, okay, I, I want a certain number of, of weapons that have a two-inch range, you know, maybe four or five, and uh, I, need, I need a few minions that I can just throw out there and bait people. I usually take one Fury because I like that fast movement eight in my dagger. To maybe go grab a treasure or block somebody, and uh, and then I look at an assortment. Okay, who has artifacts and who has destiny levels? And I try to take at least all of those with artifacts and destiny levels. Those those are kind of the things that make up what I've got. And of course, how many points can affect that quite a bit. Oh, so. oh, I I always take the same guys every single game. Yeah. Why is that? So, so that's why that's why I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's totally fine. That's totally fine. We we can't be uh, on the same wavelength constantly. We've got to we've got to jump around it's a little true. bit. It's true. We're our own people. Yeah. I I um I loved kind of out of the gate starting with the box and getting everything on the table and seeing how it worked. And like I said, there's been a few games where like having the first thing in there was clutch uh, to you know having a bit more range, etc. Um, but I've been playing with a couple more rock tusk prowlers and i even played the game against um against you josh with two uh beast callers um or beast speakers just because they are kind of a, a force multiplier um mm -hmm. and then i definitely found myself needing more bodies on the table in some cases because uh of kind of uh, losing that those uh, kind of having getting fewer activations as the game went on, if I start with more bodies on the table, it can get me a little bit further. I feel like um, mm -hmm. in getting my objectives, etc. So I've been I've been enjoying kind of having those choices. And so there's there is a variety in the fighters you can pick, whether they be the chaos uh, warbands or the the non chaos ones. Um, the destiny is interesting to track that. So that's something that that is a this this mechanic that when you um, when your fighter is is done with the game. If they survived, they have a one in six chance. If they roll a six, they get a destiny level. They've, they've found favor with their God. And, uh, in, I've heard you get to reroll dice, uh, once per, um, an attack dice once per, uh, round with a destiny per dice per, per model. Correct. Per, per battle. Per battle. Cool. Um, 
And the reason I say hurt is because I've yet to earn a single destiny dice <laughs> uh, or favor in all of this. I've not rolled a single six. Uh, some of that comes when too many of your guys die at the end of a battle. You don't have as many rolls. Uh, but but it's a pretty cool kind of uh, way of of noting that this this uh, fighter has a little bit more oomph to them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, have you found them that comes in handy a lot, Josh? I assume you get to use that a lot. Uh, I only have like five, you know, total, oh. and, and with five models that have one each. I've, I've had a couple that had them, and then they died permanently, so I lost them. <laughs> but oh. um, it, ha- it has it has been helpful. Sometimes, yeah, that extra, you know, that reroll will give you an extra hit. Um, I don't have any models with more than one yet. However, my stepson Ben has one skeleton that has three. He's he's very favorite. Oh, two skeletons <laughs> apparently that <laughs> have three destiny levels. That's Highly funny. favored by Nagash. Apparently. That's funny. Um, and then uh, what else uh, do we keep track of on the roster for our fighters? What's individual to each fighter? Pavent. Let's see if we're on the same wavelength this time. <laughs> Is it their names? <laughs> no, 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 we already covered that. <laughs> Um, no, it's their artifacts, like their gear. Um, you can sort, you can um, as you progress through the campaign, you're gonna have access to lesser artifacts after every game. Um, these are like potions and lotions and small baubles and trinkets um, that you know can be used or go away, um, and those can be dispersed throughout your warband as you see fit, as well as um, greater artifacts, um, and these will get as you progress through the campaign. Um, so those are very cool. And these are the ones where if you don't have that written down, like these are the things that can get forgotten, which is kind of fun because then you <laughs> can keep it for the next game, right? Uh, kind of, some of those are consumable and go away, and some of them are, get, become clutch. Um, have you guys had any that have just been super clutch during a game? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I've had I had one perishable artifact. So you roll at the end of every game, and on a four plus it stays, and a one, two, three, it's gone. But I had one that gave me plus one strength for a fighter that had strength four. So he was running around with strength five. It was awesome. It lasted for three <laughs> battles before it before it disappeared. But it was a great one. And there's 20 different uh, lesser artifacts to choose from, or to roll for, and quite a bit of variety in what they provide you. Um, and kind of, uh, you know, I've got a, a dog that can turn into smoke and fly for, for one movement activation. Um, and that's, that's pretty cool to just cinematically kind of activate. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. Now, once we have all of our fighters on our roster and we're ready to kind of keep track of that stuff, they've got a background, they've got kind of an origin, possibly a story hook about, you know, why they're, why they're fighting. Um, we get into playing campaign games. Um, and, um, we know we start, when you start your first game, um, you're going to start with a thousand points, um, in a campaign. Uh, and that's, you know, most of we last episode obviously went through kind of the, fastest, easiest, cheapest way to get to your first thousand points just so you could get to this first campaign game. Um, and as we mentioned, when you've got, you can put 15 of those fighter up to 15 on the battlefield, minimum of three. Um, and uh, you don't have to put a thousand points on the table, right? You can go right. up to um, mm-hmm. if you wanted to kind of risk less. I think if you wanted to, you know, if you, if there was a you had somebody who was really good, there could be a question of um, whether you wanted them on the battlefield in case you know to risk them, et cetera. Um, but often they're 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 your your best stuff. Um, when you're done playing a game, so obviously playing the game is also the really fun part of uh, doing a campaign. But when you're in a campaign, you get to take advantage of the aftermath phase. Um, so Paven, why don't you walk us through? kind of the, the aftermath phase, what's important? Uh, where do we start? Um, we start with earning glory. So this is the main currency that you acquire during the course of the campaign and campaign games, and you get it based. Everybody's going to get some glory, um, win or lose from a game. And so that's good. So everybody's always progressing. Um, and then you use that glory to uh, primarily, I, I mean, the first thing I think you should do is dominate territories, which is 10 um, glory. Depending on your warband, you dominate a territory in a different way, but usually it's erecting some sort of like grand artifice, um, being a totem or a, you know, a loon shrine in the, in the Gitz case. And 
this allows you to bring an additional 50 points um, to your games. And so as you as you progress in the campaign, your warband will expand and influence in size. And I think that's the primary way of um, the kind of growing your warband. Um, you can also use glory for a few other things. One is to make extra rolls on the lesser artifact table if you just want to get kind of more more trinkets to play with. And you can also spend some glory if you are um, going into a game where you're behind some um, when you're behind some points, like you know somebody's further along, maybe you're going against Josh and you really want to catch up. You can spend some glory to buy yourself <laughs> extra points. Yeah, 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 and. You know, that one's a tempting one sometimes, and it, it only um, you can only do that if you are, your opponent has more territory than you, Correct. Um, which yep. is an interesting restriction and kind of unlocks it. Um, but like you said, I think in this last game, I was like, I need to have, I need a little bit of a cushion uh, going up against Josh. So I added, uh, took, spent one glory for 50 more points so I could just uh, pop another planes runner on my, on the table. Mm-hmm. Um Probably should have spent more. Probably should have spent more <laughs> on uh, a first fang to get some uh, some range. Um, but it's a it's an interesting conundrum. Do I spend a little bit now to get an advantage, a big advantage, or a big boost, or do I save it to get territory and get a a shorter but longer term boost? Um, yeah, no, I think uh, the exchange is you know if you spend three glory to get a hundred extra points. And if you win, you get five glory just for winning. Then, then it might pay off. But yeah, then you got to weigh it. Okay, is the expense for the gain or or not? Yeah, it can be difficult. Yep, yep. Um, but it's 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 yeah, it's definitely cool to have that option to to use the the glory as a currency in that way, or to kind of say, hey, I'm going to bring somebody in, extra in because I've got that clout um, right. with my with my war band. So I, I or I. I kind of think about it if I've got dominated territories, I've got more food, and so I've got more battle-ready fighters, um, and so I can put a few more people on the table. I can risk a few more, you know, bodies uh, on this this fight or event, etc. Um, so that's cool. Um, let's see then, what else happens, Josh? After we figure out glory, um, what are we worried about? Uh, after that, then uh, everybody who was taken out of action has to roll to see what kind of injury they sustained. And fortunately, in, in Warcry, most of the time nothing happens. On a, uh, a one or, or on a two or three, they die permanently, like poor smoke blood. But uh, you know, <laughs> on a four or five, they they lose favor. So if they have a destiny level, then they lose that because their god is frowned upon them. And then anything above, you know, six or above, they're perfectly fine. They recover and they're ready for the next battle. Um, and then once that's you know once that's done, then you roll for the destiny levels. You know, like you said, you roll a die, and on a six, that that warrior that was not taken out of action gains favor. And then uh, and then you go your, for your lesser artifacts, and see what kind of goodies you get. That was probably the part that confused me about the roster as well. I can just add and remove people as I want. I can I don't have to like earn more people or a certain fighter type to come on my roster. It was seemed too easy. What, what I have come to realize is that when you've got artifacts on a particular character or fighter, or if you have destiny on that fighter, then that's when losing them becomes important. Um, fortunately, and, fortunate leaders cannot permanently die. They just lose favor instead, which is nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, and I definitely liked that. Um, I get, I'm getting attached to my leader and I want him to stay. Uh, mm-hmm. Smoke blood, you know, they can rise and fall, but it's a very light system in terms of an injury table. Um, it's basically you, if you have somebody who has cool stuff, you could lose all that cool stuff, um, but you could bring a, a fighter type like that right back on. They just have less stuff. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of the aftermath phase, you know, being able to pick up some cool stuff, make some choices. It's it's a little bit light. And this is where I think there's definitely, if we're talking about that future episode of, you know, ideas, I'm sure that this this space has a lot of room to play with, um, especially if you played any Mordheim or Necromunda, and there's a lot of crunch that could be added here. Um, but for getting started, and, and I wasn't sure how rewarding it was going to be, but but each of those little things that you add, like it's quick to add them or to kind of figure out what you got, and it definitely feels like you have more to play with for the next game. Would you guys agree? Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I do appreciate that the aftermath phase only takes about five minutes. So yeah. you want to do it like, you know, you're not making your next opponent. If you're trying to play like two games in a row, wait, a, wait around for you to like roll all these dice. You just kind of go through your list and 
you know, it takes five minutes and then you're ready to go and re-rack. For sure. Mm-hmm. The roster is this thing that allows you to kind of, it's the tool that allows you to kind of get through and track and uh, work with your warband and figure out who you have, what benefits you have with each of them, uh, who's doing well, who deserves a name and a paint job and who doesn't. Um, and, <laughs> uh, and kind of how you're, I kind of like think of the roster as my camp, right? Um, again, like I've got a camp of fighters and I'm bringing some of them to the table. Um, and, uh, so it kind of becomes a little bit of a, a physical space in my head. One of the coolest things that Warcry has introduced right out of the gate is the idea of a quest. And both the the chaos factions and the non-chaos factions have quests. With the introduction of uh, monsters and mercenaries, we've got new kinds of quests. And again, gets our wheels spinning on the different kinds of things that could be coming in the future. But why don't we talk and break down these different quests, um, how they work, and what's what's different about the different types of quests. Starting with the concept of a quest in Warcraft, so abstract it a little bit. Paven, tell me a little bit about the quest and and what a quest in Warcraft looks and feels like. Sure. So quests are the central like narrative hook for your your warband um, competing or uh, progressing through the campaign, and they're very individual to your own warband. So it doesn't really matter what your opponents are doing necessarily it's kind of like what you're doing over the course as you play the games and you progress on your quest for the most part just by playing games win or lose um and they have like their own um like narrative behind them they all every every warband has or every quest has its own kind of flavor text around it and rewards and like you know good like why your warband is engaging on this quest and why it's important um these quests in addition to these quests like they also have like what dominating territory means for you while you're on this quest so is it like erecting if you're the Iden of deacon is it erecting soul soul catchers that you know like that pull in soul energy is it you know pulling up your loon trends like i talked about um and as well as allowing you to as you dominate this territory if you're part of chaos dominating chaos beasts as well and bringing them into your warband yeah thralls they are these beasts that show up around the in certain uh, battle plans where you have other monsters or in twists where you have other monsters these beasts of chaos show up and they become just kind of part of the flora and fauna of the world um ooh, flora i wonder if there'll be flora someday um and uh and then you can kind of call them into battle with you as you dominate territory um real quick then if we go back to our uh, roster do you uh, uh, Josh, how do these chaos beasts work f- with my roster or my warband or when I'm starting a, a battle? How does that work? You can't really have any chaos beasts or thralls unless you're chaos force. Um, so when you dominate a territory, all all the factions get um, 50 extra points, but only chaos factions will be able to take a thrall or a chaotic beast to do that. And if it, you, you use it in your game, it doesn't go on your roster, so it doesn't take up the 20 any of the spots of the 20 that you have on your roster. And it doesn't gain destiny levels or artifacts or anything like that. So it's essentially a disposable creature that you could use for whatever you want. And it's pretty cool. And you said you you pull a f- fury into yours for a le- little extra movement. Um, exactly. You might you might you know so they're a little utility if you have something else. And uh, in Monsters and Mercenaries, we added the Razor Gore as one of those uh, chaotic beasts or one of those um, uh, thralls. Um, yep. So that you know. Uh, opens up oh chaotic beast um uh chaos spawn and um what chaos call warhounds it? chaos yep. warhounds which are annoying little nippers i bet um but uh just a lot of more variety in um kind of what's available so if you want to lean even more chaos with some chaos spawns popping out um i remember you know stuff like that from mordheim was just nasty sometimes mm-hmm. um anyway so that's just a really cool addition and something new and interesting. Um, what did you guys think about, I mean, quests are this kind of real central thing. Had you seen them in any other kinds of game systems before? Anything like this? Uh, I haven't really seen anything like this. I mean, you would have, you know, like any, in all the other skirmish games that I've played, uh, there's been, you know, you have you gain skills, you gain certain uh, weapons, artifacts, things to use in your games. But there wasn't really this 
overlying story kind of the driving the narrative in any way, shape, or form. You had to kind of do it yourself. So I have, I've really enjoyed that aspect. And, the, and, and they have a nice mechanic where it says, start here. And then as you go on, it's like your first convergence, which is your important storytelling point in your narrative. And then you move along, and it's like, oh, I found an artifact of power. And you keep going, and like the second point in your story, and then eventually your leaders you know, progress far enough, he gains a command trait. Then you do your final convergence, you, you know, complete, your, hopefully, your your quest and gain your quest reward. So it's it's kind of nice and it's uh you know very uh, the descriptions for the the particular convergences and the stories themselves are really well thought out and written and it, it certainly grips the imagination for me. Yeah, I think the piece of it that stood out to me as well. They have these things called convergences and it's shorthand for basically a pre-generated um, battle plan and uh, terrain setup. Um, for the warband to your warband to kind of take on. Um, and what's cool about it is that, well, on the, the positive and negative on the negative is that if you, if you don't pass it, you don't progress. Um, so you have to play it until you progress. And there's a aspect of challenge there, like a level that you need to get through or prove yourself on, or, you know, kind of knowing that if you've, if your warband has, um, gotten to X, you know, um, uh, track, uh, place on the tracking, um, bar that you've accomplished these kind of convergences that everyone might become aware of. Right. And so there's an interesting idea of being able to have these common, um, things that everybody experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, but then if you, but if you don't pass it the first time, you get to plan for it, you get to see it coming and you get to kind of take another stab at it and kind of, choose how you want to, to try and tackle that problem the second time or the third time. Um, I think that's, I, I think that's just an interesting approach that I've not seen in these games before. Uh, the artifact of power. Now we've talked about the lesser artifacts. The artifacts of power are something a little bit bigger um, and they, they stick with you kind of becomes this thing that you can count on now um, for every battle and you get one artifact of power correct and it always goes on your leader is that accurate uh no so you can have an artifact of power and a lesser artifact on one on the same model and it doesn't have to be your leader okay um and but each quest is only going to give you one artifact of power um so so you're 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 kind of gain that on your basic quest well, so, you, you'll get two. You'll get you get one after your first convergence, and then you get sure. one often at the end of your quest reward. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So you could have another uh, fighter with that, um, with that piece, but they have a risk of dying where your hero or your leader does not have that same risk. Correct. Mm-hmm. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so you're risk, risking that a little bit to to put that on somebody else, which you know, go for it. I mean, you, risk can be rewarding. So, mm-hmm. um, and then um, command traits. This is kind of an interesting thing. Um, Josh, what do we what do we do with command traits? Well, the command trait is, you know, you get two. They encourage you to either roll a D3 or pick one. But uh, after a certain point in the campaign, you get to pick a command trait. And, it, and there are a wide range of different things. Um, for example, the, one of the command traits for the Cypher Lords is strange physiology, strange physiology. And so I get to reduce one damage from every hit or critical hit that comes into the leader, which is kind of cool. But there are some other ones that, that you know, uh, grant different boons. And um, but it, it's, a, it's definitely a neat mechanic that kind of shows your evolution as a leader. And he's like, oh, OK, he's become wiser, a stranger, gained something along this path on the campaign. And, and, and it's a little different now for it, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that is cool. Now, if you do go through um, and and like you said, um, Josh, you get your first command trait going through. But, you know, you go through another quest and you get another command trait or you have another opportunity what uh, Paven? What happens to that? Se- what, what can we do with that second command trait? Can we just keep adding those on to our leader, or can we put them on somebody else? Yeah. So with your second command trait, it allows you to elevate um, one of your warriors kind of up a level and make them a favored warrior. And this, you know, you, they they get that command trait, they get that favored warrior status, and 
they also recommend you like roll in a background for this this warrior who is now like kind of your your second in command and this is a good way of like advancing the narrative on a on a character that isn't just your leader can you swap that command trait out for the one that you had before so could your leader just take a new one um or yeah just... your leader can just take a new command trait um but you can't like pass around a command trait like you can a uh, artifact okay. um yeah, I'm not sure because uh, I think in the in the rule book you can take a command trait and uh, it doesn't say that you can replace it. The only occasion I've seen where you can replace it is when you get an, unmulti- an exalted command trait. It automatically replaces the one on your leader, as far as I can tell. I feel like it's this little incremental thing because usually, yeah, your other warriors don't get as much of this stuff, or it's it doesn't seem as uh, beneficial to put some of this stuff on your other warriors, like the leader. Because they're not going to necessarily die, they might lose favor. Um, it's a safe bet to put it on them. Your leader can become more of the focus of your warband, and they get the cool stuff. Um, but this feels like that little nod where it's like, now nah, you can grab one more person and lift them up and let them kind of become important before we kill them and they die. <laughs> so I think it's a I think it's a nice touch because it feels like a small reward, but each of these small rewards feels somewhat more important in kind of a sparse reward field, if that makes sense. Well, I think it's just like Pavin said, it's just like you've elevated this model to a second in command and narratively that it's a, that's a great story in itself. Yeah, so it's like... Absolutely. Now the core rule book quests that came out right away, let's each take a either one or two and find, and maybe it's from the, the, the quest that you're on, um, why don't you talk a little bit um, about kind of what's the cool story hook? What's the, the one of the artifacts that you really like out of there or the one you took, um, the, the command trait that stood out, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, Pavin, you talked about uh, the bottle heist. Uh, was there another one that stood out to you, um, either for your warband or for a different one? Yeah. So I'm already on the record raving about how cool I think the bottle heist is. Um with my gang of misfits, but uh, so a different one that resonated with me is the bounty of souls, which is the Eidneth Deepkin quest. And it really, I, I like it. Okay. So like the, the background of the quest is that you are in the eight points to kind of, to like gather souls and soul energy to bring back to your enclave because you need soul energy to sustain your people. Right. That's kind of like what the, the impetus behind a lot of the Eidneth activities um, and your priests have specifically found a collection of soul energy, so your poor band's going to find it. And one, I think that ties in really with the the um, and the, the, the narrative thread for the Eidneth and why they would be in the eight points. But it also has some cool kind of connections to the geography of the Bloodwind spoil specifically. Um, one of the, where you end up at the end is a place called the Screaming Coil, which has a call out in the big Bloodwind Spoil map, and it's this corrupted soul engine by the follower, followers of Sinesh, and you kind of mm. take that artifice and like you know turn it to your purposes, and I think that's really cool that it kind of combines both like the large overarching theme, but also like a very specific place um, in in yeah. the in the eight points. Mm-hmm. So I'm jamming on that one. That's pretty cool. How about you, Josh? Anyone stand out for you, or one you want to oh, talk about? Yeah, I'll just talk about the one that my cipher lords are on, and uh, you know they're they're trying to. It's, a, it's called the Spy in the House of Talons, and actually the the short story in the uh, Warcry anthology is this exact same campaign quest. But the cipher lords have arrived to Karngrad, and they're trying to insert you know someone into the the, the House of Talons, which you know the seven talons that rule Karngrad and they want control at least one of them so they can get an inside in the politics in Karngrad and work their way into the Varen Spire. And uh, so the, the, the quests or the convergences are involved in finding a link to one of the seven talons and controlling him and impersonating him to draw out one of the seven talons and then turn him into a, you know, somehow use him to, for your, your future purposes. And I don't want to spoil it, so I'm not going to share what that is. But, uh, <laughs> but like one of the, uh, you know, the, the uh, artifact of power I got was, it's called the Whisper Mirror. And um, the Cypher Lords have a, an ability we're called Shadowy Recall, where they can pick a model. You know, the, the Luminant or the, uh, the Thrall Master can pick one of the other models within 12 inches and teleport it within a certain distance close to it based on the number of the abilities. 
And what the Whisper Mirror does is it allows whoever owns it, in this case my Thrallmaster, to pull from anywhere on the battlefield. It doesn't have to be within 12 inches, which is really great for certain scenarios. And uh, and then his command trait ended up being the Strange Physiology, which was which it would be a nice defensive command trait because he's a powerful warrior. And now you can like, okay, now I can get him into battle a little bit and not worry about you know getting taken out of action too quickly, which is cool. Awesome. Uh, so I am working through Tooth and Claw for the Untamed Beasts, and this is very much in line with the Destroyer as well. Of the two, um, this one is kind of on the road to Karngrad, which is the big city in the Bloodwind Spoils. And so they are challenging the falsehoods of civilization, and Karngrad is where they, they end their final convergence. What's interesting there is because uh, the final convergence is kind of knocking on the front door of Karngrad, the artifact of power that I rolled for, um, and there's some things that I think could have been cool. So this is where some people roll, some people pick um, because something might fit their narrative a little bit better, or something might be a little bit uh, better rules-wise for them and how they play. Um, I rolled for the Prowler Fang Axe, which adds plus one to the damage points uh, uh, by for each hit or critical hit from attack actions made by the fighter with range three or less. And so now I've got a leader who uh, hits um, for three or six damage uh, with every success. So that's pretty cool. Um, and I'm not sure, I, I think I'll probably roll for, for the command traits, but I think the one that I'm, Untamed Beast can be a little fragile, so there's one that's called Bestial Vigor, which is add five to the wound characteristics of this fighter. Um, so I think that would... That would come in pretty handy um, for for you know my twenty wound leader, um, make him a little bit tougher, like an ogre or a, or closer to an ogre or a uh, an iron jaw. Mm-hmm. Um, Definitely. So it's really cool, like you said, Josh, that yours um, the one you picked is featured in the anthology uh, Cipher Lord story. Um, this one feels very much kind of using the the places and names that are kind of key to the Bloodwind spoils. And so it just really ties all, all this together. Mm-hmm. Um, I think because they're, everyone's kind of on their own and you don't really know what everyone else is doing necessarily. I wonder how tied in they are in terms well, of like hitting similar locations at similar times. Right. Yeah. And then I think you just have to assume it's independent or things change hands so often and so quickly that it doesn't matter. It's all yep. trans temporary. <laughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. As we were talking about, the core rulebook has a ton of these. We've got two for each of the six war, uh, Chaos Warbands and one for each of the Chaos Warbands that's yet to be revealed. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we've got one for each of the non-Chaos Warbands. So when the Monsters and Mercenaries book came out, some of us just got our hands onto it recently because of the high demand. We've kind of learned about Faded Quests. Um, uh, Josh, what is new and different about faded quests what is what makes this a little bit different than our core warband quests i found these are super exciting in the book for you know a couple reasons Uh, there are four faded quests that are in the book that anybody can take which is nice Uh, but the thing i found most exciting is that you make a choice at the end are you doing this for honor or are you doing this for glory and that narrative choice affects what you get as a reward if you choose honor you end up getting an exalted command trait. And if you choose glory, you get an artifact to help you along your journey. And I thought it was kind of the first indication where your choice at the end matters. And uh, it's interesting because it's like, oh, okay, so if I take a faded quest and I get an exalted command trait the first time, theoretically, you could do another faded quest and choose glory the next time to get an artifact. You know, so it, it kind of also drives you to, oh, I could do another one of these quests and continue the story of my warband, you know, and do three or four or five quests with the same warband as it grows and changes over time, which is, you know, story-wise, I thought very interesting. Absolutely. Now, one of the the things that happens when you finish a quest, let's say, um, you know, Josh, you're in the position where you have dominated six territories, which is the maximum number of territories for a quest, um, and you finish that quest you take your artifacts and command trait with you to the next quest, but you don't start with those same territories. You have to dominate new territories in this new place all over again, correct? Correct. And you also lose all the glory that you have banked. So. Gotcha, gotcha. So that glory is very much specific, and that feels very territorial, mm-hmm. right? Um, yep. In this space, in this kind of legendary quest, people heard about you. Now that you've, you've stopped that and you're someplace else, 
it feels a little bit like um, trending, like you were in the news for a bit. And then since you're not on that quest anymore, you've well, fallen out of the news. Now you have to make headlines again. Um, uh, so um, now, now tell me about exalted command traits. Um, how are these different than our regular command traits, Pavend? So exalted command traits are um, command traits that are so like – they are aspects of your leader that your leader gains that are so like uh, central to their character and so central to their reputation in the eight points that they kind of stay for forever. So you get an exalted command trait, you can only go on your leader. It can't be put on a favored warrior or anything. And these are generally more powerful than regular command traits. And they have that strong like tie that really like kind of locks the narrative for your leader, like in the, in the annals of history. Um, so I, they're very, they're very cool. They're very, I don't know. They have strong themes associated with them. Um, yeah. And so that, that's, that's how I think about them. Did you have one? Um, because there's only four of them, I don't want to spoil too many of them. Mm-hmm. Um, Paven, did you have one of these that really, uh, spoke to you? I have, I try not to look at the results of quests because I don't want to spoil them for myself. Yeah, exactly. So I, yeah. I am excited to look at one, but it could be months off. Um, I think I did glance. I didn't. I, maybe I glanced at like what they did. And I think some of them were very strong as far as like upping the power of your um, of your of your like damage output. Um, but I don't know like the the story behind the command trait, which is really what I'm preventing from being spoiled from. Well, I mentioned I mentioned one of them earlier in the podcast too, where it gave you three extra wild die to use for the game. You know, you, you start with three extra wild die, so it's that's definitely... that's pretty huge. There's one that subtract three uh, from the damage points allocated to this fighter by each hit or critical hit from attack actions made by enemy fighters. Um, that's gonna be a pretty hard to to kill uh, thing. So I mean, like, uh, but getting through the quest is no small feat. Like. Um, as we've been coming across, like we're on, on week, uh, five or we just, uh, kicked off week five and Josh, you're, you know, a few, um, games away. So, but you've put in a lot of games to be able to get to kind of that point. Um, and, uh, and you know, it does seem like something that, um, you're going to start on that quest again and be something that's kind of even higher. It, It does give you something to reach even higher for than just, you know, the other quest that's available. Um, mm-hmm. And you could be a completionist and try and, and make your name in all of the quests that are available. Um, or, you know, you reach as high as you can, as fast as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. So those are kind of the honor ones. Um, and there's a, there's an artifact of power that lets you subtract to the, from the value of abilities used by enemy fighters <laughs> while they're within six inches of the bearer. Um, so there's some, some, penalty ones that you can debuff ones that you can get as well. And mm-hmm. I can only imagine that there's going to be, you know, uh, you know, if we've got the Bloodwind spoils, if they came out with any other books or, um, for instance, um, there's a quest in, uh, the September white dwarf, uh, Josh, did you get a chance to, to take a look at that? And, and, uh, what did you find? I did. Yeah. So, uh, the Warhammer store locally did have a copy in store. And so, I think Monsters and Mercenaries has added a lot of really cool tools to integrate within the campaign to extend it and change it up. And I think this um, White Dwarf article is a campaign event. So it's something that you can do anywhere within the campaign. And it's just taken out of the sequence. It's not part of your campaign quest, so it doesn't count as one of those games. And it's just a chance for everybody in the league or in the, in the campaign to duke it out in the arena and find out what's going to, you know, who's the best fighter, that who, who is Karngrad rooting for. And uh, it was it's cool because it's a series of three different games, and uh, two of the games there are two war bands duking out for the champion, and in the third game there are four war bands. They've reduced the points to 600 points with a maximum of five models, and so you're taking your best, your biggest, and your best into the arena and, and trying to get glory and fame points, which are converted into glory later based on activities like killing models or using your abilities and kind of garnering the uh, the audiences and the crowds. Um, favor but there are also this random event table that you roll for like the crowd may turn on you and start throwing vegetables and stuff you know so there's some random events as well that affect how the games go and uh, and then the warband with the most glory at the end of the the arena bout wins you know the the event 
but I thought it was really nice, and, and hopefully we'll see more of these kinds of things that you kind of slot in a campaign to change it up, spice it up, some extra, you know, bragging points and before you continue on your campaign quest. So, so. No, that sounds fantastic. Like, even, even um, you know, five weeks in, it's a brand new game, so I don't, for a lot of the people that are, you know, playing consistently, et cetera, I don't, I feel like people are still kind of, you know, going well on the campaigns and the things that exist, but we've been talking about a, um, you know, do we do a mid, like in the middle of the campaign, do you break it up or change it up? Um, between campaigns, definitely we're looking at, you know, changing it up and trying some different things just to kind of uh, shake the cobwebs off and get ready for something else, et cetera. We'll talk more about that a little bit later, but um, it is it is cool to have something like this to just kind of pull out of the bag and 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 kind of make part of the environment that we're playing in. Mm-hmm. Yep. Anything else that you guys want to say to talk about um, either um, quests in the core rulebook or quests in Monsters and Mercenaries that we haven't mentioned? I would like to reiterate like how much of a hook this is for me when playing the game. This isn't something I've seen from any other Games Workshop product. This kind of like um, narrative like catered experience that they like obviously put a lot of effort into it. And I like just really, it really gets me excited and really lets my mind, like it really lets me connect kind of the narrative story I want to tell with my games, um, with the rules. And so it, it, uh, I I think it's just like something that like I can get excited about week to week. It's like, Oh, I'm progressing on my campaign, my quest. And I'm like getting cool item and good gear. And, um, but also being able to tell a story along with it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree sure. completely, and I, and I think the format is in such a way that, you know, based on, you know, if you're creating your own campaigns, and you, there's a format that you can follow, and you just have to come up with, okay, for this convergence, this is my story, and this is what I've got to do, and, you know, so you can easily make new campaigns, I think, and slot them into whatever environment or situation or warband that you're going to be playing, so I think that that just shows room to grow, really. Yeah, so. there's a aspect for me that has to do with, like, these chaos warbands are meant to be like individualistic, right? They're roaming, they're nomadic, they're a lot of them are kind of doing their own thing. And there's an aspect of like the, the personal quest that really digs that for me, like um, feels like that, that sentiment Um, Mm -hmm. and being able to make that choice. Like, yeah, we're playing in a campaign together, but I get to decide what my narrative is, which campaign I'm on, what's important to me and my warband for, you know, this, this phase or whatever. Um, and, and I think it'll, it, you know, might be different when you're playing in a, in a day event or whatever, but just to kind of like say, Hey, you get to do your own thing and we're all kind of doing our own thing, but it fits together. Like is just a, is an interesting aspect of it that I wasn't expecting when, from a campaign system. And, and I think you're right. Like, this is my quest and I'm on it. And to some extent, except for the convergences where somebody has an opportunity to pause me. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Or I'm, 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 I'm still progressing and I'm still moving despite what happens and despite what happens to you or, um, or even to an individual fighter. Like it's, it feels, it doesn't feel cheap in any way. And it feels like very, I I find it very rewarding to kind of just win or lose. I'm progressing to, to a large extent. And I think, you know, narratively, you know, the way, you know, you can you can easily write a story around, oh, I'm in the A points and, and my first few battles before I get to my convergence are encounters, random encounters while I got to Korngrad. And then my first convergence is fighting against Legions of Nagash. But narratively, it's like, OK, I fought this war band in the city, completed my convergence based on the story. And then you keep going. And it's just like. These are just kind of mimicking elements that are in the environment around you, the encounters, the war bands you run across in pursuit of your own quest. So I think it all ties together nicely. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Well, very cool. Uh, I think we all say well done. Well done, GW, on these uh, these quests as an aspect of, of things that our war bands get to accomplish. Um, and uh, it just – there's so many of them, and they seem like something that are going to be – a lot of options to choose from in the future um, and a great way if if you're looking to create content for war cry creating new quests um, could be a really fantastic way to kind of just add some flavor and give somebody something unique and and there could be a lot of little hooks or twists in how they're created in the same way that the faded quests have a choice at the end 
what else could be at the end of a quest that makes it unique um, and something worth kind of I'm going to I've only got the ability to do two or three quests in a in a, in a season or a year. Which ones am I going to do? What's going to how am I going to make a name for my my war band? Which which uh, things are going to be important? And I think as there are more quests that will become even more interesting to see who completes what. Um, and what choices we make in that regard. So um, let's move on to the other thing that Games Workshop put into Monsters and, and Mercenaries, but also some in the core book. And that is specifically the monsters uh, that came out of uh, Monsters and Mercenaries. Um, and not all of them are monsters, but let's start there. Um, we've got, besides a... Now, when it first came out that we were going to have monsters involved and you could do uh, monster battles um, and even some of the first um, battle reports that I've seen on YouTube are kind of like, hey, you and I are fighting and there's a monster involved. And it, and at first thought, I'm like, hey, it's cool. We get to put monsters on the table. Um, did you guys have a similar impression to me where it's just like, hey, yes, put monsters on the table. That's what I want. Um, any, and did you guys have any gut reactions to Kind of or or initial thoughts to what you thought um, putting a monster on the table was going to be like in this kind of skirmish game. Uh, My gut reaction, Eric, was this is hella cool and I can't wait. Yeah, 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 yeah. And re- cracking open this book, and I've been reading Monsters and Mercenaries like pretty much every day since uh, I picked it up on Thursday. Um, yeah, and it is super cool, and the 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 battles where you pick them up are very thematic and very and i can't wait to play them and i really want to paint up some monsters so i can play games with other people with them and you know have my own challenge battles with them but i guess we can get into it yeah yeah well let's get into that challenge battles um now i in my head i was like all right yeah i get to maybe i get to fight a monster battle and then i get a monster and i'm going to put in my battle tell me about challenge battles pavin um how are these different to quests what what makes them kind of unique? So challenge bat. So there's a lot of things that make them unique, and I and I kind of think of them. They're kind of designed as maybe end game content where your war band is already pretty advanced. It's already like leveled up a bunch. It's gained a lot of territory. Maybe it's completed its quest, and it can go on these challenge battles um, to in order to for like to get a monster or get or get more artifacts or more glory. Um, maybe not specifically glory in the game sense, but glory in the general sense. Um, I think you're cool. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Finally be cool. Um, and they have a very specific rules around them. And a lot of these challenge battles revolve around you, like your whole war band versus one terrifying beast. Um, and that's just like that in of itself is very cool, but each of the beasts or like sometimes groups of beasts have their own specific scenario of like why you're fighting the beast, where are you in its lair, and then special rules around it. So I'll give you one example um, for the the beast of destruction, which is the um, the arachnoc spider. Um, it one of the things it does, it, one of the special rules it has just during that scenario is it disappears, and that special rule is like where'd it go? And so like when you think about like movies where you're fighting a monster, sometimes the monster disappears at one point. And then you're like, there's a moment of high tension when you're waiting for where that monster is going to reappear and grab another member of the gang. Right. Um, and all of those, <laughs> all of those um, scenarios have those cool hooks and those cool rules. Yeah. Josh, what were you thinking about when you've read through this? What stood out to you as being kind of different and interesting for how it played different than a, than a quest? Yeah, so one of the things I thought was really cool about the, the challenge battles is, you know, like the new roster indicates – a checkoff box for each challenge battle, you know, like you said, to encourage you to complete them all, you know, and um, they all require, they also have some minimum requirement, like two territories or six, depending on what it is. And you have to risk, you know, in case of like one of them where you, you have to have at least two territories and you risk losing one if you don't succeed. But, uh, but what I thought was really cool is, is that it, again, it's kind of like this uh, campaign event in the white dwarf is where it removes you from your story for a moment and you don't, you don't progress on your campaign chart. You don't, you don't get any destiny point or you, you think you, you can roll get death or destiny, but you don't get any glory or anything, but it's, it's, a, it's, a t- it's like your war band is taking a break to go, 
prove themselves in the eight points or capture a beast for their future use. And uh, and so it's kind of diverging from the campaign to do this glorified quest and challenge themselves and then come back to your campaign. So it's kind of this break. And again, it can, I think it can extend the campaign and add more flavor to your war band and bragging rights as you're progressing through the campaign. And again, just kind of narratively elongates the campaign path and allows you to do more things within it. Yeah, I, I think that's kind of cool. One, you got to be in a campaign, right? You got to be mm-hmm. kind of progressing through something, and you have to have already um, made it a certain amount of distance, you know, to be able to wager something. Um, and and it kind of it kind of gives you a challenge rating in that regard. Like if you've done that, right. you probably have X Y number of artifacts. You probably have uh, a few destiny points, um, and you know that will make this a little bit easier you know if you've gone through a faded quest you probably have you know a a big bad artifact and and command trait it changes things up a little bit you're you know you're progressing in your in your quest you've done it a few weeks in a row or or you know six games in a row and you're computing and you're like hey you know what i don't i don't need to rush through this quest um i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna go ahead and do this battle over here and um what what's cool about similar to the convergences or any other battle where you have well the, similar to the convergences I guess in that your your opponent um, is kind of they might progress in their game but they're not they can't do their convergence at the same time mm-hmm. um, in this your opponent um, or one of the other players in the campaign takes on the role of the monster um, so rather than there being an AI um, you know your opponent is you know could be Josh or it could be Paven. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, not not you, the listener. Unlikely that uh, Josh or Pavin is your opponent, but they're they're <laughs> likely to be mine. And oh, that's, oh, 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 you oh. know, uh, I have to watch out for that. But um, it, so you get to play around with monsters versus somebody else. Um, <laughs> you know, before you might have uh, you know gotten your own monster as part of your your roster, right? Mm-hmm. You get to jump in and and I think there's something to be said about being able to, even though I haven't achieved it yet. I get to play with monsters, right? Mm-hmm. They give us a way to get started playing monsters uh, as an opponent for somebody else. Um, so, um, uh, so that's cool. Um, and some restrictions there. Um, uh, let's see the they dictate points per side in a lot of these. Um, they uh, you can't use your dominated dominated territory points as bonuses above that. Um, and so it, it really narrows in what the challenge is and, and to see if you can come up against it. And you had said something interesting that, you know, you, that, uh, one of the things is that not all of these monsters, um, or not all these challenges have the same outcomes for everybody. So, um, you know, for instance, Paven, you mentioned the, the Ragnarok spider, um, the if you are a destruction warband and you fight that beast, you have the option to uh, break its spirit, um, which is the ability to gain it as part of your roster. Correct. Um, but if you are not a destru- don't have that same faction keyword, then it gives you an alternate, which is usually roll three times on the lesser artifact um, uh, table. So you you defeat it and you find its loot. Right, you loot the the layer that the beast was in. Well, you sell uh, its body parts. Oh, right there, you go. <laughs> uh, you chop it yeah. up and and you sell it sell it off at the market. Yeah. Um, but you know, like I, there's actually, I think when it dies, it just throws treasure up in the air. <laughs> <laughs> bling 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 bling, and then All you the collect above. it. <laughs> uh, so pick your pick your favorite uh, um, video game RPG trope uh, for beating a monster and collecting artifacts or D and D, and so it kind of emulates that, um, but not. But there's still value in maybe fighting that. If not for, you know, maybe three lesser artifacts doesn't feel awesome to you if you've already got a bunch. Um, but you know, to be able to say that your warband defeated it, or that you know you 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 defeated that um, uh, that monster yeah. with your with this warband A or warband you know B or you know this time yeah. around or that time around. So um, yeah. Eric, can right. I add one thing too? Yes, please. Um, so one of the things, in addition to all of these great rewards, is that in the expanded Warcry Warband roster in the back of the Monsters and Mercenaries book, 
they've added a checklist of things to do and complete that your warband can do. And so all of the challenge battles are on that checklist. Mm -hmm. And so um, if you, you know, you complete a battle and outside of all those, all those things, you get to check a box on your, on your list. <laughs> bragging rights, and baby. Is, very, bragging I mean, rights. Is, all these battles are cool. And there's like seven of these and it'd be really fun to just go through and see if you can complete them all with your warband. Are oh, we yeah. learning anything new about Pavend, about his, your relationship <laughs> with checkboxes? Oh, no, I love the idea there, need too. To check them. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, the, other, the other aspect of that I think is really cool is that these challenge battles, they break a lot of the rules that are in their core rule book, you know, in some cases. Like the challenge battles, and some of them, you can go up to 1,500 points, which you can't get to in a normal game. And in case of the the largest challenge where you have to have six territories, that that, that warband has two thousand points you have to fight against with fifteen hundred. So it's it's super it's, it's really really hard. And in that battle, you can use up to twenty models, which you normally yeah. can only have fifteen on the table. So that they're they're really interestingly designed, and, and I think designed to really be a challenge for bragging well, rights. Yeah, and so. Josh, to go over the top of that. Not only do you have to complete these battles, but before you do that, you have to get these miniatures and collect and paint them. Yes, so that that's, is. <laughs> that's a challenge in of itself, and in the one that gets me really excited. Like, oh, I have to collect and paint all these monsters so I can play against them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It even says so, in the book, you have to collect and paint the monster so your opponent can use it against you. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and and before, you know, there's going to be some people who, who kind of feel like, oh, they're just... Uh, making bigger point games and and bigger things to sell more models. First, yes, um, and second, uh, because we want them to. Uh, I mean, having this opportunity, like you said, it it gives you an opportunity to play a different size game. Uh, to to what is it um, when you um, empty the bench uh, yeah. is the phrase, right? right? Where you're like everybody on the field, um, and you know you bring all 20 of your fighters or like you need everybody or you have to risk everybody right that means all of your best fighters are at risk um because you're you're dealing with the roster still with the roster that you started the quest on like you can't you can't just go and pick you know different models so if you're going to do it you got to make sure that you kitted out your roster and like you said like painted the right models and and got all that stuff together so it gives you it might feel to somebody as something that's a barrier for them because they they the core set and the core rules, you know, a thousand points up to maybe thirteen hundred points. Uh, if you dominated territories and that's you know a box and a half or you know a half dozen or a dozen models or something like that, um, guidelines for for beating that. So yeah, that could yeah, that could be an interesting like blood sport where I beat it, you know, or uh, you know like hey I did it in in fourteen hundred uh, points or something like that. Right, yeah, and and to that point, um, you can't use anything outside of your faction. So you can't use chaos beasts. You can't use allies. So so you really do need to have those models and, and to your you know. So it could be you know prohibitive for some people if they don't want to collect as much. But it does allow for those who do or who have larger AOS you know model collections to to try some of those larger battles. Absolutely, absolutely. Now. We've been talking about the beasts. What are some of the what are some of the beasts that uh, you know? Um, I'm sure if you've read about it or been on the uh, check this out yourself, you know some of those. Um, you mentioned the, the Arachnorak spider. I'm excited ever since uh, you know uh, our friend of the show, Davey, um, from the the What the Hex and and uh, Story Phase uh, podcast, um, pulled out. He got a Cygor for his Beast of Chaos. Um, uh, Warband some years ago, and it's murdered tons of my wizards. Um, <laughs> I've always wanted an excuse to get that uh, without you know picking up a, a full Chaos Warband. I've got my eyes there for sure. Um, Josh, do you have any monsters that you have or you're putting on the table next? Yeah, no, I didn't have one, so I, I definitely picked up a, a Chimera because uh, I have a genetics background and then chimeras or hybrids genetic hybrids and i was like and it was always something uh I, I wrote a story about when my genetics class back in college and i was like oh i gotta have one of these so i, I definitely grabbed one of those <laughs> nice paven is the the spider gonna be yours or do you have other ideas i have other ideas the oh. the one i've got i've had in my eye actually before this but this would be a great excuse is the charybdis um yeah it's a really yeah. cool model and I really would want to put it in my, with my kind of emerging but untested Iden at Deepkin. Oh, yes. 
a war band because a crib disc comes from under the water and the idnath come from under the water so it's mm-hmm. right, right there there it's you go and there you go yeah, and I, I really like the model too. Now one um, one thing to to note is, and we hadn't mentioned it yet, is for these challenge battles, when you when you have a monster in your game as one of these challenge battles, or if you bring it in your roster, everybody in the challenge except for the monsters get these monster hunting abilities you can use in addition to your own, and some of them are quite powerful against gargantuan creatures. So that's something also adds to your toolbox if there's a monster on the table. Tell me about one of those. Um, for, for example, there's one that doubles the damage you do from crits, you know, for that, you know, it's a triple, I think. And if you use it, that fighter for its entire activation gets to double the damage of the, of the die, you know, so if it's a, you know, the ability is a, you have three threes, you get to double that to a six and you add that to your crit damage against that creature for that, that activation period. So, yeah, there's one about, you know, um, throwing ropes and tying it down and, and limiting movement, et cetera. And yeah. there's just, yeah. Really mm-hmm. cool thematic um, abilities, and I think that's a great touch for sure. And I think I think it definitely helps. You know, if people are worried about, oh, this guy's bringing a monster, how am I going to handle it? I think that's a nice way to say, hey, we got these monster hunting abilities you can use to fight that monster. Don't worry. So you're about saying it. not just during the challenge, um, the challenges, but anytime a monster is on the table, you add those abilities to your warband to to combat it. Correct. That's really cool. That is really cool. Um, man, you get a third set of abilities when a monster is on the table. Like, talk about a reward system for somebody else bringing a monster. Uh, <laughs> that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So, why don't we uh, go ahead and take a break? Just one last reminder that this is the last episode of Dogs of War Cry on the Mortal Realm stream. We hope that our love for the Age of Sigmar setting comes through in all of our podcasts that you listen to. Whether it's the Mortal Realms story phase, our Underworlds podcast, What the Hex, or this little gem. If so, consider dropping a tip over at themortalrealms.com forward slash Patreon. Thanks. All right, we are back. Now, not all of these foes that we're fighting are monsters um at least in the in the the literal sense um the kind of curveball that got leaked but um i was not expecting was that there is a an ever chosen war band um and the what's cool about this war band is so it it first of all it uses some of the kind of classic chaos warriors with their big shields um or you know uh double hand weapon it it uses some of the chaos chosen which are not they're not a um neither of these are models that you see a lot on the table but they are they do uh, are sculpts that do last the test of time at least the chaos warriors do i haven't seen the chosen as much um and then leading them or the leader for the the this is a um a Varengard, which is the the giant like um, chaos knight of the ever chosen of Archeon, uh, that you know uh, goes into one of the I believe six rings of the Varengard, um, and these are the elite of the elite, um, and these are big models on big mounts uh, running mm-hmm. on the table. Um, I, I guess first impressions from you guys on. Um, on this faction, um, Josh, what what were some of the things that ran through your mind when you when you saw that that was an, an option on the table? Um, I was I was really surprised, like you said, and because uh, you know I didn't didn't expect that, and then I was like made sense that it was more of a challenge, um, you know, rather than something you could take because you know the first images showed that they were really powerful. Uh, I think narratively it, it's perfect because you're trying to get Archon's attention wandering around here. And, and there's the last part of one of the sentences in the in the hand of the ever chosen description says, you know, but slaying one of these dark paragons would surely attract Archon's gates for good or for ill. So and I love that touch. It's cause like, yeah, you could, you could really tick him off or maybe he'll be impressed, you know? So, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but it's definitely the hardest challenge in the challenge quest. And I thought that was pretty cool, but I'll let yeah. Paven touch on some of the other fun stuff. Um, one is that the Varen Garter is an awesome model or it's like an awesome set of models because they come in groups of three and like the opportunity to like paint one and play with it is very cool. The beast on the table. Um, and I don't know when I, when I think about what's one of the things that's really exciting about this, this um, challenge 
is that it's really like end game content for Warcry. Mm -hmm. So it yeah. requires six dominated territories. So you have to be top level. You have to wager two, and then you have to bring fifteen thousand points against two thousand points of this OP Varengard the Retinue Warband. Um, clarify, fifteen hundred points, right? Yep, yep, yeah, fifteen hundred points. What did I say? Fifteen thousand? Yeah, yeah, it was, it was well, awesome. I was next. like, maybe that's. Are <laughs> They're always trying to get an advantage. We're oh, yeah. trying to figure out if we're like playing bends. AOS in War Warcry. Yeah, you're pulling the bends, but it's still going to be an uphill battle. To yep. um, and then you get like at the if you if you are succeeding if you succeed and like the Varengard also has the magic item called the Demon Forge Blade, which increases its already ridiculous damage. Um, yeah. But if you, if you defeat them, then you get this Demon Forge Blade. So uh, how cool? Yeah. 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 Um, what's, yeah, narratively, I love that, like, yeah, if you're knocking on the walls of the, the Varen Spire, these guys are probably going to come out to greet you and, uh, test your metal. Um, or, you know, we talked about this a little bit in the anthology episode. Um, the, the, the eight points have these highways. So the Varen Spire is at the center and there's these giant highways infrastructure leading out to each of the great, um, realm gates. And they are just reinforcements after reinforcements after reinforcements of of his his armies marching. And so it's these if you um, so generally we're playing in what's called the arteries, the offshoots and kind of the in between these the we're in between the spokes of the wheel. Um, but if you get too close, uh, these guys are going to come out and, and whoop you. Um, so there's there's a lot of yeah narrative play where where might you run into these guys? Um, what does that mean for your narrative? Um, you know, what's the end result? And yeah, to have that kind of cool weapon as a as a possibility there. And and I hope. I mean, obviously we haven't played these yet. I hope they're really hard. Yeah, uh, I think I think this will be. <laughs> yeah, I, I got the book open right now. This Varengard is gonna whoop you. He's like six attacks, strength six, five and ten damage. And his artifact gives him plus one. So it's six and ten damage on six attacks of strength six. So I was like trying that. to speculate what uh, Gotrick Gurdensen would be as a <laughs> as a model in this if he were to, you know, like 30, treat him. 30 attacks. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but you treat him instead of a, a warband, you're fighting this one puny guy um, and he's just wrecking house uh, yeah. trying to, yeah. to destroy chaos. Because uh, if you've read uh, or I've just finished listening to Realm Slayer for the upcoming. Um, uh, Mortal Realms episode, and and he spent most of his time in the the realm of chaos up until you know reappearing in the in the Mortal Realms. Um, so he's just been whooping chaos butt left and right um, all his yeah. way all the way here. So uh, he's yeah, got to show up in it. Too is is too much for for Warcry. <laughs> right, right, yeah, exactly, exactly. All right, you uh, can yuck uh, my yum on that one. Yeah, yeah. Well, oh, I, uh, I really like that. Uh, the, the the visual image I get is you know one of these war bands we're playing walks up to the Varen's fire and makes a rude gesture to you know Varen guard on the wall then and I was like oh here they come we start this fight that'd yeah, be a no, great way to just kind of taunt and earn a little extra glory you know or earn some you know if you could go to the wall taunt and and get a fight and then win it you know right, get you right. an audience I'm sure yeah that's awesome that's awesome all right. Um, now, the other things, you know, kind of in this uh, I wanted to mention is, you know, yeah, we have these kind of challenges, but similar to like, um, you know, smoke blood fighting the th your thrall master, um, you know, like there's opportunities as you're playing your opponents uh, to create nemesis, right? Other people that you're trying to beat in the um, uh in the campaign. So, you know, uh, Josh, you and I obviously had a, had a fun end to, with our last game uh, rematching where you got a chance to avenge. Um, and so that's something that is a side effect. It's not something that's baked into the rule set or any of these, um, but having that, that nemesis. Um, but I also think, I mean, any one of these creatures could become that thing that you've been trying to beat over and over and over, uh, but are trying to tackle it, but I had a hard time or whatever, like the convergences, I've got to beat this thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, have you guys formed any uh, besides me? Uh, <laughs> have you uh, formed any, uh, any uh, kind of crucial um, rivalries uh, in our campaign? 
or any war bands that you're like, oh, I need to beat that one. <laughs> I, have, I, I have a meta rivalry against Josh because I never <laughs> beat him in any game. <laughs> It'll happen eventually. Don't worry. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Don't patronize me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I definitely, you know, since my stepson plays as well, we we have this informal rivalry, you know, which is sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, sometimes he just gets like, I'm done playing you, <laughs> play somebody different. Yeah. But um, but it is fun because it does create this interesting dynamic where we're learning about each other's war bands, and you you learn you, you learn to dislike certain models, certain, so it's kind of a fun rivalry. And, and narratively, in the past, we you know with skirmish and AOS, we'll write short stories about the battle and and how our leaders think things went, stuff like that. So yeah, but. yeah. Um, now let's get into the other aspect of monsters and mercenaries. And that is the ability to, to bring in allies, um, to your war band. Um, and so this is another one of those goodies that we get to, when we're filling out our rosters, something else to think about. Um, uh, the allies, um, there are allies for each of the grand alliances. So chaos, order, destruction, and death. Um, and those allies, are not required to play the game. Uh, they take up a spot on the roster like any other single fighter, regardless of the points cost. Um, they don't have the same faction symbol that your other fighters have, so they cannot use your um, uh, faction abilities, um, but they come with their own set of abilities. Um, they also kind of... Um, can't take the artifacts and things that you win uh, from the different quests or from from battles. So they have to kind of stay with the the things that they come with because that's their standard loadout. Did I miss anything in terms of how the allies function with the warband? Yeah, just a couple of just clarifications. One is that they they go on the roster, but they have their own special spot on the roster, so they don't take up your twenty slots. Nice. They have their own special six slots you can add. And you get one per territory. Um, so as you as you dominate territory, you can add allies. And if you lose territory, you have to take them off your roster. Um, and the other thing is they can't have command traits and they cannot have artifacts. So that kind of keeps them from getting too out of control, I think. Yeah, but they can have destiny levels and they can die. So you know, so so you do yeah, roll for injury at the end of the battle. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Nice. Um, and uh, you know, so obviously there are a lot of heroes for that are included here. Um, Josh, did any of them kind of stand out to you? Um, I guess to to kind of bring into your warband right away, or uh, or for a future warband or anything like that. Did which one uh, which one caught your eye to to get started? Yeah, no. So I, I first I started looking at which ones I already owned, you know, for a variety of reasons, the different board games and whatnot. You know, some of the Zinch ones look great because it add they all have range, and I have no range, so it'd be kind of nice to add one of those. But uh, but also the the Dark Oath Chieftain um has a really neat. Well, he's got lots of attacks, high strength, and uh, his his ability because all of these uh, characters come with their own special abilities is a double, and it's exactly. Well, it's exactly like the uh, you know the little squig hoppers quad where he gets to add the value of the ability to damage points allocated to enemy fighters for each hit or critical hit from his next attack action, and it's only a double. So he could be quite nasty with five attacks using a double yeah. and just slaying stuff with that with that attack action. So <clears throat> how would you, Paven? Anyone jump yeah. out to you? Yeah, Josh just finding the finding the most OP character on there. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm, I'm just, yeah. Um, so the, the, what I'm most excited about is the adding every member of the Gabapalooza to my Warband, because oh, yeah. I think those are my favorite models that came out of the Gloomspite release that I don't own. Um, and they all just got a ton of flavor. They all are very evocative of different kind of parts of the Grot psyche. And they're all like, pretty none of them are super tough they're all like 80 points and you know they just have like a potion that they bring to the table and so i'm really, I'm really excited to use those i already have my cave shaman painted up and so like he's probably be the first person to come in when we you know decide to start adding allies 
Um, so I'm very excited about all those. They're just going to fit right into the rest of my goblins. Um, I think my runner up for allies is being, is adding the God specific heroes to the different war cry war bands. Cause I think that's a really good idea to good way to tell a story of like, um, like where your war band is on the path to glory. Uh, mm -hmm. So called like, Oh, are they leaning one way? Are they starting to get influenced by corn? Are they getting more like bloodthirsty and martial? Or are they starting to like, you know, dabble in the arcane arcs and they have like, you know, a, a zinch sorcerer around. And I think that's all very, very cool and, and, and <clears throat> narrative and thematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Because, you know, the untamed beasts are very, you know, furs and skulls, there's definitely some appeal from the, the Dark Oath stuff. Mm -hmm. And they, like you said, they do have some really cool abilities. Um, but I, I find myself leading a little bit towards the slaughter priests. Um, as a more like religious aspect uh, from the from the corn roster, and they have um, uh, a couple abilities that are cool from the uh, from the books and from some of the the AOS play, and that's blood bind and blood boil. Um, it has some range, 14 inches, um, and and uh, you're again moving them kind of uh, towards you a number of inches for blood bind, and then for blood boil. Um, you <laughs> grab, uh, pick a fighter within 14 inches and roll a number of dice equal to the value of the ability. So it could be five dice, six dice, and for each four up, allocate D3 damage. Um, wow. So you just have the ability to reach out 14 inches and just turn somebody to soup. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, he's coming with, he's not tough. He's only a tough forward like the rest of my war band. Uh, 32 wounds. Um, and one of them has, uh, you know, uh, just a, you know, an axe with, you know, whatever. And the other one has a flail as well. So there's a little bit of flavor there, but I felt like they're very much kind of like on the path. Otherwise, look and feel the exalted death bringer has, you know, big horns coming off his head and feels very like he's a, a heart eater that just kind of took, got his, like his last heart was a doozy. Um, <laughs> and he turned to like full chaos beast. Um, but the, I mean, the brace shaman seems really cool too. I mean, not because it's, there's anything special there, but just like it beast. feels like they'd hang out with a, a, a beast shaman. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, anything else that popped out to you that you were unex that was unexpected to you? Um, for instance, we have Stormcast Eternals Warrior Chamber, um, which we don't have a Warrior Chamber Warband yet. Um, are they able to ally? They are able to ally with the Vanguard because they're in the same column, um, et cetera. Um, were there any that were out of faction um, there that you weren't expecting to see? Like, yeah, I'll just leave it there because I could I could go on with another one. But were there any that you weren't expecting to see in here? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I thought I thought they came up with a wide variety of choices, which I thought was really nice. You know, for each, you know, they didn't limit it. You know, like Stormcast, uh, Stormcast only, which I thought would have been a mistake. I think having it, you know, by alliance is a great way to add variety and allow people to, you know, for example, uh, Legions of Nagash are all very slow, but now they can take a uh, an ally. That's night hot and is super fast, you know. So I think it allows some of the factions to mitigate some of their weaknesses by taking a, an ally or a mercenary to help them shore up some of those weaknesses and, and help them fight a little bit better against certain armies or in certain circumstances. So I think that's really nice that, that they have a wide variety of models to allow a lot of flexibility and flavor, like Paven was saying, to tell a story for each of yeah. these war bands now. And I wanted to add, like, and I haven't used any allies yet, so this may be a little bit talking out of my butt, but the, <laughs> like, it feels like it fits in really well with kind of your war band. What I was, I guess I was a little nervous that these were just going to be, like, really powerful fighters that just kind of replaced your leader mm -hmm. and just, like, up the power level of the game, but just adding them kind of as mercenaries that just come in and they're just on, they're really not core pieces of your war band. They are like external actors that happen to like join up with you like a mercenary and they add like their own kind of their thing on the side. Maybe they cast a spell or two, but they are like outside of the core thrust of your war band. And they kind of just add that extra flavor. Um, I think feels really good and really cool. And it's mm -hmm. like a great opportunity to add more miniatures and more hobby projects to your, to your play. Yeah. And I think yeah. I think they balance it nicely because you you know the abilities you can say oh I can I can use 
either my abilities or their abilities, but you don't get both. So you still have to make some really strategic decisions on, okay, which one is more important? Do I want to teleport my guy or do I want to use his special ability to get over there? So I think they balanced it well in that aspect. And I think there's a real trade-off for these cool abilities where they're going to they're going to take up quite a bit of your your space uh, if you field them on a on the battlefield. Whereas, you know, I'm leaning towards adding more bodies, um, having uh, you know that hero that kind of ally comes in better do some work, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, to justify right. it. <laughs> we've talked through the quests. We've talked through a lot of these artifacts, either the lesser artifacts, greater artifacts, the legendary stuff from the um, faded quests. Um, we've got multiple types of quests. We've got monsters that we can fight and and kind of nuances to how and when we can fight them so it doesn't feel like cheap or anytime we want. Like You really feel like you have to earn first the right to step up to it, and then second, you might not get it in your first go. Um, and so there's some like sense of, like, do I risk it? Uh, it does feel like from the outset that there's some... Like, these aren't just givens that you get to just go and have. Um, right. And... And with the addition of Monsters and Mercenaries, what I like about it being released so quickly is the promise that it has for more. Either a roadmap or giving us as um, players, event organizers, content creators, etc. an opportunity to think about what could come next. And if, it, if Games Workshop doesn't do it, I've got enough pieces where maybe I could create something. Um, and we've seen that. We talked about that last time where members of the community are springing up all the time and adding their own spin on things. Paven, we've been talking through all these cool things. What are you most excited to apply and, and kind of get, get playing with next of all these things? So the things that I am, that are really getting me going the most right now, as we talk is I really, um, really want to start playing some monster challenges, uh, finding a way to get those monsters into my games. I don't know exactly what what the path forward is as far as like hobby to get make that happen i do have a giant that i can run as a chaos giant um and maybe that will be a good way to start or you like i don't know if we i start buying buying a bunch of monsters that's that's really exciting to me the next thing is i'm really kicking around putting together a full varen guard war band and getting like the necessary painted miniatures to like field that challenge that seems like very a very satisfying and very like contained hobby project so it's probably going to be like 10 miniatures well and you uh, put out the idea that you know could could the three of us split a box and each get our own varengard let yeah. me ask you yeah, yeah, yeah if you had the choice pavin of uh putting together a varengard they give you some different options in there for kind of how they get modeled and kind of what maybe a little bit hint of which God they serve, where would you go first? If you were to build uh, one of these um, ever chosen factions, would you lean into one of the, the chaos God themes? Oof, great question, Eric. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't thought far enough ahead to like actually have like a hobby vision for them. I mean, I really dig the black and gold classic scheme of like, the chaos undivided. And mm -hmm. I think like once you're a Varen guard, I don't know, actually, maybe I don't know the narrative as well, but you've kind of left behind the, the path of the gods and you kind of put yourself above the gods in that you follow, um, Archeon the ever chosen. Um, so I don't know. What are you, what are you thinking, Eric? So I was thinking that if you guys chose the other ones, I'd be okay with Nurgle because I've never painted anything Nurgle and I know that people have a good time painting some Nurgle. Um, <laughs> and so that'd be kind of cool. But I think the one that I'm excited for the most is the one that has kind of like the, the dinosaur Raptor face. And I, I see that as being more of a corn style. Um, so the, and then the, I think the third, they have like a Zinch style head. Uh, and there's one that looks, looks and feels maybe a little slaneshi. Um, so I, I mean, I think that they give you some, I think they give you a lot of bits in there to go a bunch of different directions. Josh, do you have a, uh, would you f try and go more Zinch or Slanesh or anything like that? Well, that's a great question. No, I haven't looked that closely at uh, what parts come in that kit. I know it's quite impressive though, but, uh, but you know, just based on Cypher Lords and so, you know, I, I'd lean, I tend towards Zinch if I was going to do any sort of chaos God, but I think in this case, I'd probably tend toward a, uh, undivided you know use chaos to your powers but not be swayed by them sort of thing yeah. 
Anything else, uh, you know, while I deter, you know, took that for a little bit, Pavin, anything else that you're excited about? Yeah, I would love to find a way. So our, our local campaign is has four more weeks left in it. I would love to find a way um, to, like, expand it into an evergreen campaign that is, like, all of Madison. That Because, like, I don't have, like, enough time in four weeks to do everything I want to do with my squig squad, right? I want them to collect allies. I want to go on multiple quests. And like any short time period campaign, like you can't do all those things. So I was like to find a way to like build a good system for just like have an infinite campaign of endless violence in the eight points. Um, so yeah, I that that's where I that's kind of what I'm that's what I'm thinking. Of. Josh, what are you excited about? Yeah, so um, I'm definitely excited about getting my cipher lords painted up since now that I've got some color scheme in mind and i've got to put it to the test and see if i can pull it off uh but you know i've got the chimera really excited to get that together and paint it and try out some of the faded quests and challenge quests that are in the book and um you know you know since i have some of the allies giving them a shot as well but um i'm really enjoying the campaign and you know we've had discussions and ideas and i'm looking forward to trying out some of the new stuff in the book after the campaign and then seeing what you come up with for the next set yeah yeah. Awesome. Um, as we've been going through this first few weeks, um, you know, and we're, we're nearing on to, so yeah, we started fifth week. So we got three weeks left of our campaign after this week. And um, I'm feeling like we're going to end the campaign really strong um, uh, with, you know, a considerable number of, of people past their first convergence, et cetera. Um, and we're going to take a break and we're going to dig into monsters and mercenaries into the you know second campaign um still need to figure out how to you know as you were saying paven uh the concern of you know making sure that people who are coming in with a fresh war band uh feel like they've got you know uh, get fun games and they're not fighting a monster necessarily first game um and and i think that we have the capabilities to do that because we're you know we're curate like we're spending time with people and then they come in and we're we're trying to make sure people get good games um but um but like make sure people get good <laughs> make sure they get <laughs> get good at this game um i'm really looking forward to building uh playing on some more unique boards um so we've been playing on the the kind of starter set terrain at the warhammer store and this most this past week i got to go over to, to paul's house and play on the gibbering uh, dome terrain and he had the boxes open and he goes go ahead and build something and you just it's adult legos and you go over and build these things and if you saw some pictures on twitter we, we created what i thought was a pretty wicked uh kind of mm-hmm. tall um temples what I yeah, yeah, it, yeah 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 it kind of just was really cool uh, with lots of stairs or elevation etc and then um that was a fantastic board to play on i really felt like i was visiting somebody else's like territory um and we we kind of played that narrative where he uh had had lured a um a, what are those those winged cockatrice. cockatrice into his territory in order to lure me into hunting the cockatrice into his territory um where he pounced and uh so it was just kind of cool to add that bit of narrative i've got the what i'm calling the plunging spines um uh, location that I've built and then uh, I hope to run an event uh, with that kind of in, in mind and then I've got to this week get started on my shanty town uh, keep going on that um, so that we're playing outside a hammer hall or something like that um, and then similar to what you know you were talking about Paven is like how can we get like a a citywide board ranking or something like that. Um, and maybe if this is a step towards it, you know, we're going to finish up our campaign and we're at the Warhammer store. Um, Madison has um, five gaming stores, six locations, uh, seven locations. Yeah. Um, Embarrassment of riches. Yeah. yeah. And, and so just a ton of options. And I don't think war cry is being played at all of them, um, but, and, or even age of cigar being played at all of them, but there's a few places where it's being played. And, you know, there's, there is a, a, um, 
it makes sense that each of the stores is a bit competitive in wanting to kind of get people shopping there, playing there and, you know, playing there so that they spend their money there, et cetera. And we're big supporters, uh, the whole moral realms crew us here of, of paying where you play. Um, and so if you're playing at a store, buy some stuff there. Um, uh, and we've got, we're a little, you know, embarrassment, embarrassment of riches here for the, our options. So after we're done with our campaign, I'm, you know, I know everybody, we know everybody else. And so I know, you know, uh, one of our buddies is looking to start a campaign at one of the other stores. Well, <clears throat> I'm working with, you know, our Warhammer store to, to kind of set up and get started for another campaign. And now it's important. And it's important to me that, you know, that there is, that, that there is a campaign running somewhere. Um, and I can, can help with it. Um, and I can't necessarily make it out to this other store, but I want to support it. I want to support more war cry in more places so that it's easier to, for people to get in wherever they're comfortable. Mm-hmm. So I would love to find a way to kind of like connect those campaigns where, so the, my first attempt at that was I named, uh, the Warhammer store, a, a location. And in the sense that you, you could become the, you know, you know, if Josh continues with his winning streak, he'll become the champion of this location. But somebody else could go play at that other, um, uh, you know, spot. Or maybe Josh is like, hey, I've already championed this place. Uh, I'm going to go <laughs> right. try and, and own over it at, at the other store. Um, and, you know, that that's kind of an achievement unlock as well, right? That you play in different campaigns at different stores as a way of... Um, of of building up a war band in each location right um so i would love to find a way to kind of work with different organizers across the different game stores so that you know all of these things kind of blend together and feel like they're part of something so Mm -hmm. we've got uh at in the next three weeks we've got our um, campaigns painting contest uh and you can enter any number of i think up to a thousand points i said um Mm -hmm uh, into your contest and, uh, for, and we do, they do a store wide over a whole week of voting from various people that come into the store. And so it's kind of another way to attract people into like cool miniatures and cool war bands and, and playing war cry. So, uh, I need to get my untamed beast ready for that too. Anything else you guys want to talk about before we put a wrap on this episode? Oh, just super excited with uh, the different formats that we can play the game now and, and looking forward to trying them out and seeing what else people come up with. So, Absolutely. Paven, anything on, on your mind before we go? No, I'm great. Yes, you are. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Again, thank you two for joining me uh, to talk about uh, commencing our quest. And uh, thanks for listening, all of you out there. It's time to put a muzzle on this episode. If it was a good, good dog, support the show with a positive review on iTunes, sharing it with friends, joining us for hobby discussions at themotorrealms.com forward slash discord, or leave a tip at themotorrealms.com forward slash Patreon. More content is available at themotorrealms.com and on Twitter at Dogs of Warcry. Warcry.